In this video, I want to talk about the assumptions of factor analysis. And I've put the C here to indicate that really what we're talking about here is confirmatory factor analysis. So the setup here is as we have normally, we have V observed variables, which I've denoted here by Y, and we're trying to explain the variance and covariance of these variables by means of a set of shared factors, which I've denoted here by F, and we've got little f of these share factors and there is also a component of each of the observed characteristics which is not due to the shared factors and these are unique to those specific variables and I've denoted those extra components of the variance by epsilon here and we can rewrite this entire system using our vector notation which is just that y is equal to capital lambda times eta plus epsilon. So just to be clear here, eta here represents our vector of our unobserved factors. So that's the vector of f1 through to ff. And y here represents our vector of our observed variables. So that's y1 through to yv. Lambda here hence represents the weights of the different factors on each of the different observed variables. And epsilon here represents the specific unique variances. Okay, so we just rewritten the model that we had before. What are the assumptions of confirmatory factor analysis? Well, one of the assumptions is that the expected value of y is equal to zero. What does that mean in practice? Well, that means that essentially each of these observed variables has been standardized. So what do I mean by standardized? Essentially what we have, if we consider, let's say the first component, in its raw form, the first component had a value x1. Then what we've done is we've taken off the mean of that variable, which I'm gonna denote here by mu1, and we have divided it through by its standard deviation. And if you do that, this new transformed variable y1 actually has a mean of zero, so the expectation of y1 is equal to zero, and it also has a variance which is equal to one. Why do we do this standardization? Well, we do it for a variety of different reasons, but one of the things about it is that it actually makes variances equal to one and covariance between individual variables are always less than one. So it always, in principle, makes actually covariances and variances to some degree comparable. Okay, so firstly, we've got that the expected value of our dependent variable is equal to zero, or technically a vector of zeros. So this first assumption, really what it implies is that also we have that the expected value of eta is equal to zero, and similarly for the error term, the expected value of epsilon is also equal to zero. So basically all of the variables are in some sort of standardized form where we're looking at deviations from that variable from its mean. The final assumption is that the expectation of eta times epsilon transposed is equal to zero. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that there is no covariance between our underlying factors and our disturbance term epsilon. So what's the intuition behind this specific assumption? Well, what it says is that after we have controlled for our underlying factors, which are contained in our vector eta, then there is a sort of residual component of the variance of y, which is due to factors which are in no way related to those underlying factors. So it's kind of like an idiosyncratic error. 